Well, hey, we have been in a series here at Faith Family based on the Sermon on the Mount. How many of you have been enjoying this, ser- this series based on the Sermon on the Mount? This actually, if you remember, uh, Jesus was on the side of a mountain. First, he was teaching his disciples, uh, and then eventually a crowd gathered. And so we're actually in week 12 on this teaching series based on this sermon that Jesus taught. And I believe it was some of the most prolific and even revolutionary teaching ever. And if those disciples, his first disciples could learn something from it, how much more can we, his current modern day disciples, learn uh, from the teaching that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount? And so, so far what we've seen is that this uh, message that Jesus gave uh, on the side of a mountain is actually broken up into sections. And so the first section we, if you remember, uh, was the Beatitudes. And this is where Jesus taught us uh, who would be blessed. In the Beatitudes, the second section uh, was just a short one message teaching called Salt and Light. Uh, And this is really where Jesus taught us who we are and what we are to do. How many of you know that we are to be salt and light in this earth? Uh, The third section that we've been hanging out uh, in the last few weeks has uh, where Jesus teaches us how to be great in the kingdom. And I don't know about you, but I don't really want to just be mediocre in the kingdom. I don't want to be known for just sort of being like just barely making it in the kingdom. If God gives us instructions about how we can be great in the kingdom, I think it would be awesome if we strive uh, to ascertain that to be great in the kingdom. And so Pastor Josh actually finished up section three last week with an incredible message called Don't Retaliate. If you missed that message or if you missed any of the messages so far, I encourage you to go back and check those out on our YouTube channel, on our podcast, whatever. Listen to those things. Get caught up. I believe it'll be a really big help uh, to you. This weekend, we are jumping into section four, and we are going to dive into section four, which is entitled Take Heed. This is where Jesus teaches us what to beware of. Take heed what to beware of. In fact, Jesus will give us eventually six things uh, that he encourages us to take heed of or beware of. Uh, Today, we're just going to talk about the first two. And so uh, if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you a title. I encourage you to take notes if you can. You can actually follow along with us uh, in the Bible app if you'd like to and write some things down. You can bring an old-fashioned journal and write some things down. But here's what I always encourage you to do as you're listening. If the Holy Spirit's speaking something to you, write that down. It's probably more important than anything I say anyways. I might say some really amazing things, but I'm telling you what, what God speaks to your heart during these times is what matters most. Write those things down so you can go back and look at that and keep that before you. So today's title is How We Give and How We Pray. How We Give and How We Pray. Let's jump into the scripture here, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. It says, take heed right off the bat. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward." But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. I want to jump back to verse one, because I really believe that that gives us some framework for all the things we're about to jump into here, even in this section called Take Heed. And so if we can jump back to verse one, and if you'll hang out with me for just a minute, sometimes I like uh, to nerd out just a little bit and go back to the original language, uh, the Greek language that this was written in, and pull out some of the definitions and some of the meanings, because I think it helps us to understand a little bit better what this is saying. Because I don't know about you, but I don't use the word take heed very often. In my just everyday vernacular, I don't tell my coworkers to take heed that they doth not eat my lunch in the staff refrigerator. I just don't use the word take heed, and I don't, I don't think most of us do. Uh, and when you look in the Greek language, what that word actually means, sometimes it can be translated as beware, or even some translations say watch out, or pay attention, Pay attention. This to me, when I hear take heed, beware, pay attention, this to me sounds like warning language. 
This is the kind of language we use when we say, hey, listen, there's a potential danger that can be avoided if you would just simply pay attention to what I'm saying. So maybe you've actually seen a sign on someone's backyard fence that says, beware of dog. What is that telling us? That's saying, hey, if you're looking to come over this fence for any reason, you must just beware that there's something on the other side of this fence and your decision, you've been duly warned. So you're, you're at risk of your own consequences there if you decide to come over the fence. It's a warning saying there's potential danger here, but because you are being uh, warned or we, you know, getting some kind of pay attention, beware, take heed, uh, you can avoid that if you would just listen. And so as we look at verse one, take heed or pay attention that you do not do your charitable deeds. Again, another word I don't say very often, the charitable deeds. Sometimes that's translated as good deeds or good works. In the Greek, it actually says acts of righteousness. Acts of righteousness. These are the things that we do, listen, not to gain right standing with God, but these are the things we do out of our right standing with God. Because we already, as Christ followers, as disciples of Jesus, as those who have called upon the name of the Lord, we have right standing with God. We are righteous. And so there are certain things that we do out of our right standing with God. They're not to earn his love. They're not to earn a right place with God. They're things we do because we already have right standing with God. So these are our acts of righteousness. And he says, take heed that you don't do those charitable deeds or acts of righteousness before men. Look at this, to be seen by them. Now this word to be seen, it actually is from the root word where we get our word theater. It comes from a Greek word theatron, where we get the word theater. Now it may, it's a little different than maybe what we think of in, in theater today. In those times, the performers in the theater were willing to do whatever it took no matter how obnoxious or silly or foolish or rude or crude or wild, they would do whatever it took to simply gain the applause of the audience. In other words, they were like being a spectacle or a show. And so when we read this sentence and think about it in terms of what some of that original language meant, verse one might read something like this, pay attention that you do not do your acts of righteousness before men like a spectacle or a show in a theater. And that's just going to give us some framework here as we start to look at some of these acts of righteousness uh, that Jesus lays out for us, that we do not do those things like a spectacle or a show in a theater. So in this section, Jesus is going to cover three acts of righteousness in the section of scripture. Today, we're just going to talk about the first two, but the three that he covers right here in Matthew chapter six is our giving, our praying, and our fasting, three acts of righteousness, our giving, our praying, and our fasting. Now we could of course list more acts of righteousness than this, but this is what Jesus uh, is dealing with right here in this passage. Uh, And I think that in all three of these things, he's really saying beware, take heed, or pay attention about how you do them about how you do them. And so I wanna zoom out for just a minute before we really dive in uh, to anything. I wanna zoom out for just a minute and take a look as we lay some groundwork uh, at what, uh, what we can see or note about these three acts of righteousness that Jesus will list here in Matthew chapter six, our giving, our praying, and our fasting. What do we see? What do we note that's in common here? Number one, Jesus assumes that we're doing these things as Christ followers. He already assumes that we're doing these things. We're already giving and praying and fasting. He skipped over the question, if you notice, about if we should do these things. He skipped over the question about maybe why we should do these things. Jesus was standing there teaching his disciples and he said, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. In other words, if you are gonna be my disciple, if you call yourself a follower of Christ and you want me to be your teacher, when you give, 
and when you pray and when you fast, these are the things that should be operating in your life. These are some things that we should note in the life of a disciple. Here's the thing. I think there might have been some disciples standing there, maybe a little nervous, shaking in their sandals because their fasting game was just a little bit less than on point. They hadn't maybe been giving or praying or whatever. And maybe some of us feel that same way, like a little bit starting to sweat just a little bit. I want to encourage you. God's not here in his word to, to condemn us or make us feel bad. What he's doing, what Jesus is doing so masterfully here when he says, when you do these things, he's calling us up to a higher standard. He's saying as a Christ follower and as a disciple, these are the things we should be doing. So, hey, listen, just get it straight. And now I'm going to teach you how to do them so that you can have maximum kingdom impact. He's talking to his disciples, teaching them how to live in this new kingdom. And so obviously there's some things that need to be operating in our life as a disciple. So he just makes the assumption that these are the things a Christ follower and a disciple are already doing, calling us on up to that higher place in him. Amen. Number two, what else do we see or note about uh, these three acts of righteousness, our giving, our praying, and our fasting? Number two, I believe that these things reveal and challenge what's in our heart. If you think about it, all three of these things are pretty closely connected to our heart. Uh, if you think about our giving, Jesus, come on, everyone starts squirming. Jesus puts his, his finger right on your money on your material goods and on your, your stuff, your things, when he talks about giving. But he, why did he do it? It's because he knew that, that our things, our material goods, our money is somehow so closely connected to our heart. In fact, Matthew chapter 6, 21 says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so he's putting his finger on a few things that he knew were gonna be really closely connected to our heart. And that's gonna be very important. Just keep that in mind as we get into this, that he's touching some things that touch our heart. Think about it here. Don't you think it's interesting that the very first thing that Jesus says take heed about or beware of is related to how we give I think it's because he knew what a, what a struggle it might be for some people because of how closely connected it is uh, to our heart. But I believe in this, that Jesus wants to really talk to us and give us, uh, he wants to give us some direction about the place that giving has in our life and then the heart that he desires that we have towards it. Here's what I believe that giving reveals or challenges in our heart. This question, what has most value in my life? What has most value in my life? Uh, I think about our praying for just a minute and how closely connected that is to our heart. These are the conversations that we're having with God. These are the things that I'm taking time to talk to God about. These are the desires of my heart, the things that are closest to my heart that I would talk to God about. When he talks about our praying, he's literally talking about what's on the inside, what's in our heart that we're talking to God about. And I believe that it challenges or reveals this, this question, what has priority in my life? What has priority in my life? And then our fasting. Okay, Jesus is putting his finger on your plate. Yes, yeah, someone say, don't go there. <laughs> He's talking about your food. Jesus is saying, hey, take heed, beware, pay attention. And then he starts talking about what's on your plate. Listen, I'm not going to go there. This weekend, I'll let Pastor Mike go there in a following uh, message. But Jesus did go there. And I think there's a reason he went there because he knew that this was somehow closely connected to our heart. And I believe it challenges and reveals uh, through the question of what has control in my life? What has control in my life? We'll get there, but not right now, not today. So we're talking about these three acts of righteousness that Jesus lays out in Matthew chapter six. We uh, see that Jesus assumes we're already doing these things as Christ followers, that these things reveal and challenge what's in our heart. And then number three, uh, there is a reward attached 
for doing all of these things. We see it throughout all three as he talks about them. It's the same pattern. There's a reward attached for doing these things. And apparently, you can lose that reward. Apparently, you can lose that reward. I think sometimes even when we think about our giving or our praying or our fasting or whatever it might be, whatever we might do as an act of righteousness or a response to God, sometimes it can feel a little uncomfortable to think that there would be a reward attached to it. But Jesus actually said there is a reward and it's possible to lose that reward. So here's where I'm at. I think if there's a reward for these things, I want to learn how to do it so that I can get that reward so I can walk in that blessing and in that favor that God has because he's not just talking about out in the future someday. He's talking about right now, right here and now, there are rewards for the way that we live our life for God. And then if he's giving us a warning here, he's saying there's a potential danger. What is that danger? Perhaps that we could lose that reward. In verse one, I think that he gives us one reason. We see that, that framework that we laid in verse one. He gives us one of the reasons why we might lose uh, any reward for the things we do in him. And that's really trying to do it to be seen by others. Remember that idea of being a spectacle or a show or making it a, a performance. He says, hey, that, that's a, about a heart motive here. And all of those acts of righteousness that we've been talking about somehow touch the heart because he's really dealing with our heart motive in all of these things. And when we do it with the wrong heart motive, we lose that reward. But the good news is that if it's just a heart motive, then that means an adjustment can be made. We can just simply make an adjustment. Let's get into and dive in a little bit here about what Jesus said specifically about giving. Verse two, Matthew six, verse two, it says, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. This idea about blasting a trumpet, um, we probably, I don't think anyone, I'm looking around, I don't think anyone in here brought their trumpet today for the offering. I don't think anyone has been blasting a trumpet when they give, but maybe social media or maybe some other way that we might blast it out before people. In, the, uh, in, in some of the Bible scholars that look at this uh, sentence or this phrase about uh, sounding a trumpet, some of them feel that maybe it's just a, a figure of speech to sort of like paint a picture, uh, but others say that it's it's possible that in that day, the religious leaders would go out of the synagogue and sound a trumpet out into the streets, almost like a dinner bell, uh, to call those who were poor or needy uh, to come and get a handout. And in a way, it was to say, oh, it's just to let people know we're giving something away, but it was a way to announce to the entire city or the entire town, hey, we're about to do our act of righteousness. And so he, he's saying, don't do it like that. And I love that he says, um, don't sound the trumpet as the hypocrites do. You might have in your mind what that word hypocrite means, but I'm gonna give you one, come on, one more Greek word. This word means like a performer who's acting underneath a mask. So he's saying, don't go out there and blast a trumpet or make a big noise or make a big spectacle or show about your giving. That's what the hypocrites do. That's what the actors do who put on a mask and the outside, what you see, doesn't actually represent the inside. They're putting on a show. They're putting on a performance. And what you see outwardly is not a good representation of what's actually happening inside underneath that mask. And Jesus said, hey, don't do that. Don't put on a show. Don't put on a performance when you're doing your acts of righteousness. Verse three, he says, but when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I don't think he meant to slip your hand in your pocket when you pull out your cell phone to give by text. So one hand can't see what Jesus is saying here. And he does this so masterfully. He's painting a word picture that hopefully will stick in your mind. What he's trying to help us see and understand is that when we do our giving, we should just do that as discreetly and quietly as possible because it's not for others to see. It's really out of a heart motive to honor him. 
Here's the key, verse four. Uh, that when your charitable deed, that your charitable deed uh, may be in secret and that your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. I believe this, that God sees not only what we do in secret, but I believe that he sees that secret place of our heart. He sees that inward motive. He sees what's going on in that secret place of our heart. And, and by saying this, I believe that he means we'll be blessed when we do these things with a right heart. It's a simple message. Here's, here's what I've noticed too uh, with, in regards to that reward being attached to some of those things. I've noticed uh, that when the hand of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God, the reward of God comes on somebody or a family or a church or a business or a group of people, it's really hard to hide the favor of God. And you can see that anecdotally all through the scripture. You can read through the Old Testament that when the favor of God or the blessing of God came upon someone, it was super hard for them to hide that God's hand was on their life, that God's hand was on them. In fact, there's a picture that God paints for us in the Old Testament uh, of a young man named Joseph who had a coat of many colors. Uh, maybe you've heard this story before. His father gave him this coat uh, because he favored him. It, he was, it was his favorite son. He gave him this coat of many colors. And in that day, it was probably a very expensive coat. It was probably a unique uh, piece of garment. It was multiple colors, so it was attractive to the eye. This was an outer garment meant for that young man to wear on the outside that when he was out among people, they could physically see that the favor of his father was resting on him. Guys, there's a blessing and a reward that comes from God. And when it comes on us, sometimes it's visible. You can't hide it. It is hard to hide when the blessing and the favor of the Lord rests upon you. And that comes as a result of serving him with the right heart motive. Amen. Let's move on to the second act of righteousness that we're going to look at today, which is prayer. Matthew 6, verse 5. It says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, uh, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Guys, this is really dealing with our personal prayer time. This is not talking, Jesus was not talking about those times where we come together as a church family to pray uh, maybe for a certain thing or pray in a certain direction. We've come together at different times to pray for our Christmas or our Easter worship experiences or love is read. Uh, in fact, we come together as a church family, if you didn't know, every first Saturday of the month. You can pull out your calendar real quick. Put that recurring reminder in nine o'clock at every campus online. We meet on Zoom. 9 a.m. We come together on the first Saturday of the month as a church family to pray in a certain direction. We pray for our kids and students. We pray for different outreach events. We pray for our nation. We pray together for different things and, and our leaders. And here's the thing. If you love to pray, that's a great thing to come out to. If you don't love to pray, it's a great thing to come out to because you'll really be inspired. You might think you don't know how to pray or you don't know what to say. Coming together with other believers, praying in a certain direction and learning together, it's a really powerful thing. So uh, I would encourage you to be part of that and step into that and learn about prayer. But hey, Jesus actually isn't talking about that right here. I'm talking about that right here, but Jesus wasn't. What Jesus is actually talking about is our personal prayer life. When he's saying, hey, you go in your room and you shut your door and you pray to the Father who is in the secret place. I think that it's an interesting thought that one of the um, rewards for prayer is seeing answers right here and now. One of the rewards for prayer is literally seeing answers to our prayer. And I would hate to trade the idea of trading effective prayer in, in order to impress people. 
It feels like a really cheap trade-off uh, to me. But I want to read something that James, the half-brother of Jesus, actually wrote. Um, he was talking about prayer, and I think this gives us a great snapshot of what prayer is to look like. Because, you know, I think that one of the functions or one of the intents behind prayer is that uh, God wants us to line up our faith and line up our words and line up our heart and line up our prayers with His Word and with his heart and with his desire. And prayer is actually designed and intended to be a mountain moving force in our lives. When we connect and line up with God's purposes, God's plan, God's word, we actually have a, the ability to have a mountain moving force in our life called prayer. And so let's see what James had to say about it in verse uh, chapter five, verse 15. James said this, and the prayer that is of faith will, look at this, save him who is sick and the Lord will restore him. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Just one verse, look at how powerful prayer is already. Verse 16, confess to one another, therefore your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins, and pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Look at this, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. He says here that when your heart is in the right place, when this is earnest, heartfelt prayer, that you can actually make supernatural, dynamite, miracle, explosive power available in your life. Do you need miracle power available in your situation? He said that when your heart is lined up, that your prayers, it's not about if you know all the good things to say. It's not about how eloquent you are. It's your earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer that makes that explosive dynamite power available to your situation. Let's look at it and, and keep reading here and we'll see an illustration of it right here. It says, Elijah was a human being with a nature as we have. In other words, he was like a guy just like you and me. With feelings, affections, and a constitution like ours. And he prayed earnestly for it not to rain and no rain fell on the earth for three years and six months. And then he prayed again, the heavens supplied rain and the land produced its crops as usual. What a powerful example of what the earnest heartfelt prayer can do. And I don't know about you, but I don't wanna trade effective prayer to try to impress somebody or try to make them think that I, have, I am so spiritual. Look at how I'm praying. I don't want to uh, try to blast out like on a, with a trumpet or, or show myself off to anybody else like a performance when I pray because I don't want to trade the reward of answered prayer here and now to try to get the praises or the applause of people. So we've been talking about this warning language that, that Jesus uses, take heed or beware or, or pay attention. And, and I think really what the warning is, what he's really just trying to tell us to beware is beware of trying to be seen in our giving and in our praying because we can lose all rewards, both present uh, and future. I really believe this also can be applied to anything we do for him, to honor him. We live, and you know this, we live in a culture that is quite literally obsessed with getting views, uh, with getting clicks, with getting shares, with getting likes, with getting follows. We live in a culture that, that whether, whether you know it or not, whether it's conscious or subconscious, the culture that we live in is pushing people to do whatever it takes to be seen, to be noticed, to get, to get views. In fact, there are some platforms that have put out challenges for young people to do some things that are crazy or dangerous, even mean, even rude, obnoxious. This to me sounds like what we talked about at the beginning, to be seen, that word in a theater where the actors were willing to do anything it took just to get the applause of an audience. We live in a culture that pushes that. Whether it's, like I said, whether it's conscious or subconscious, our culture celebrates getting views. And here Jesus shows up and tells us to do the exact opposite. He said, no, don't do anything you can to be seen. He said, in fact, do everything you can to not be seen. 
When you're doing acts of righteousness and things that would honor me, do whatever you can to do that in secret. Keep your heart right. This is not about pleasing people. It's not about being seen by people. It's not about gaining the applause of an audience. It's about honoring him with a pure heart, with a heart before him that honors him and is pure in its motives. Completely revolutionary, completely countercultural. And I think if it was revolutionary back then, how much more revolutionary is this teaching now? We, they could have never imagined what we have with social media and, and the different things, the different pressures that exist. And Jesus taught, hey, when you're doing something out of your right standing with me, hey, do it in a place that's secret, quiet, discreet, not to be seen by others. I wanna invite you to stand. If you're watching online, you can change your position as well. You can stand if you'd like to. The psalmist asks a question in Psalm 24. Essentially, he says, who can stand in the presence of the Lord? He says it like this, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? In the next verse, he answers uh, his own question. And it says, it's the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. And, and I love this because today, what we've dealt with in our giving, our praying, we touched on fasting for a minute. It's all dealing with heart motive. And he says, who can stand in the presence of the Lord? It's the one who has clean hands and a, and a pure heart. And like I have mentioned before, that if we have been off in our motive in any, in any way, in any part of our life, maybe uh, God's been dealing with your heart throughout this and the motive has been off. You've been doing it with the wrong motive, whether it's giving, praying or something else. There's been a motive that's been off. And this moment, all it takes is an adjustment to say, God, forgive me. And you know what? As a church family, all of us together as individuals, as a church family, we can say, God, a simple prayer, give us clean hands and a pure heart that we can stand in the presence of the Lord and that we would not lose the rewards that you have for us here and in the future. We're gonna take a minute just to sing uh, together and allow you just to let God minister to you and you talk to him. And the question there is just, is there an area in my life where I just need to adjust my heart motive. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity just to be in your presence. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity right now just to even uh, take a moment to examine our hearts. And God, if there's a motive that's been off in any area, God, we ask you this simple prayer. Father, we say, give us clean hands and a pure heart. Help us to make that adjustment even now in this moment as we shift our focus back to you, God, the only one who is worthy. Father, we thank you that you hear the cry of our heart, God, that we would just have motives that are honoring to you and pure before you, Father God. We thank you uh, that you're moving here in our midst, Father God, and that as a, as a church family, Father God, we're seeking and pursuing just to be uh, holy before you, God, with pure hearts. We thank you for it. We give you all the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. And as we're just still in this moment, where God's moving, His presence is here with us as we're still in this moment. I wanna give an opportunity to anyone who might be here who has never received Christ as their Savior. Uh, you would know this if you look back on your life and you say there's never been one point where I know specifically that I called upon the name of Jesus and asked Him to be my Lord and my Savior. Uh, in the Bible, it says that all of us, all, you and me, all of us, we have fallen short of God's glorious standard. We've fallen short of His glory. We've sinned, we've missed the mark. And so we, we're in need of a savior because of that. Uh, and so God sent His Son, Jesus. If you've never heard this, God sent His Son, Jesus, to the earth, fully man and fully God. He walked as a man on this earth yet without sin. And because of our sin, he took the penalty of our sin. What we deserved, he took that on his body on the cross. He was actually crucified like a criminal would be crucified. He received the same death and penalty that a criminal would receive, taking our punishment on him. And the Bible says that when he died, he went into hell. He actually conquered hell. And then on the third day, God raised Jesus up from the dead. He showed up here on earth, appeared to some people, and then he ascended into heaven 
where he now sits at the right hand of the Father. Our Savior Jesus lives. And the Bible says in Romans that if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the Bible says you will be saved. And so today I wanna give an opportunity if you've never done that, maybe you've never heard it like that, maybe you've never heard what Jesus did for you. Today, if you're here in this place and you've never accepted Christ as your savior, or maybe you did and you know that you've slipped away, you know that you've fallen away and you wanna come back. Right here in this moment, I wanna encourage you and challenge you, why not today? Why not come back today? Why not come to God today, call upon the name of Jesus and receive him as your savior? Why not today? So as you just close your eyes again in a, in a moment being real still, searching your heart. If you're here and you say, that's me, Sarah, include me in this prayer. I'm gonna lead a, a simple prayer in just a moment. If you would say, that's me, Sarah, I need to receive Christ or I wanna come back. Would you slip your hand up? Just real bold, this is between you and God. Put your hand up, they're going up all over the room. And if you're watching online and you say, Sarah, include me in that prayer, drop it in the chat, our team, let our team know you wanna be included in that prayer. You say, today, I wanna receive Christ or I wanna come back to God. I wanna make it right, today's my day. Let's do it. Would you, Faith family, would you pray this prayer out loud? Listen, when you pray this prayer, if you've raised your hand or you know you should have raised your hand, let's pray this prayer out loud, real bold. I wanna encourage you, you're praying to a real God who hears your voice. Let's pray this prayer. Say, oh God, I confess that I've sinned and I need a savior. Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and make me new. I receive your forgiveness and I call upon you now as my Lord and as my savior. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Amen, hey, listen. There are many of you who raised your hand and prayed that prayer. I wanna encourage you in this. I wanna first of all say congratulations on the best decision of your life. I wanna tell you this very sincerely that as a church, we love you, we're for you, we're proud of you. We wanna help you walk out the Christian life. And so our host is gonna come in a moment and give you some instructions online. We'll give you some instructions of how you can connect with us. We wanna get some information to you that'll help you walk out the Christian life. But I wanna encourage you, don't leave today without telling someone that you prayed that prayer because we wanna walk with you. We believe this, that the best is yet to come. When you make a decision to follow Jesus, maybe you could look at your past and you see a lot of ups and downs. The Bible says now there's just gonna be a lot of ups and ups because the Bible says we go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. And so as a new creation in Christ, you can look forward to ups and ups and we wanna walk that out with you. And so I wanna encourage you, Pay attention to what our host tells you to do and do it so we can connect with you this weekend. Amen. Faith family, I wanna say thank you. It's been an honor to share with you uh, this weekend. Let's give it up one more time for those that prayed that prayer. You can take your seat.